live. Eric Bazaran, what's up, brother? Hey, what's up? How are you? <laughs> That's good, man. So it's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, it's been a really long time. I think it's probably been over a decade now, right? That we've yeah. we've actually seen each other. Oh, for sure. Because I remember like, going to your jiu-jitsu class and everything. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you took a different path from jiu-jitsu, though. Yeah. You, went, you went the boxing route and uh, definitely the right path, at least the way that it looks right now. So before we get into the deep stuff, where did it start? Where were you born? Um, you know, wh where did all the story for Eric ba Bazran get started first? Okay, for sure. So I was born and raised in Surrey. Okay. Yeah, and, and then I started doing karate when I was like four years old. And uh, from there on, I just kept doing karate. And I ended up going to Sutella's where I met you guys. And uh, they said I was too young to do the kickboxing program. <laughs> well, that, that's how I started doing the boxing program. And from the first day, I just loved it. So what got you in there, though? Was it your dad saying, I got to get get him in because he's a small kid? Or or was it more you had the drive and desire to get into the gym? Well, karate was mostly him just teaching us like discipline and stuff like that. And then from there on, when I started doing kickboxing and all that, that was from myself. And I was really self-driven to do that. But also props to my dad because he'd take me everywhere. with Whether it was kickboxing, boxing, going to travel to the States, anything like that, I was always with him. Yeah, for sure. I yeah. always saw him at your classes. Like, like he'll actually sit through the whole class sometimes too. He wouldn't even just like drop you off and pick you up. He'd actually yeah, be there. I, I used to do back-to-back -back classes. Sometimes I'd do your jiu-jitsu class and go to boxing right after. So yeah, he used to be there the whole time. So you were like under 10 years old, right? At the time, and I was then, about about ten, yeah, ten, eleven, yeah, yeah. And then you were you do like what was it? Because boxing would be right after jujitsu, so you yeah. do jujitsu at six, and then right away you do boxing, and then you wouldn't leave. You were already at a young age. You're already training like two, three hours a day. Oh yeah, no, I've been training hard from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so, walk me through kind of the journey a little bit now. So we met. You were part of my jujitsu program. We were discussing off air first. Um, then your dad had a conversation about, uh, me and your dad had a conversation about, okay, you know, what do you, what do you think? You know? And I, I asked him flat out. I'm like, first of all, I think he should go in one direction. And I told him, you know, I was, I'm, I have a, it's good. It's good for, for people to people communication, but it's bad for business. <laughs> so I told him, I'm like, jujitsu doesn't have like much of a financial future for you. Like, unless you become like world champion, there's not a lot. You could be a gym owner and stuff, but it's like a long road. And then you really like boxing as well at the time. Yeah. So then I told him like, hey, I think maybe you should take the boxing route, but I think this gym's not going to be the best gym. Yeah. So then at the time, we recommended you to go to uh, Beasle Martial Arts because because Jerry was there, right? He was a re really credible coach. So how about you take it off from there? You went from Sutella's, your dad finally decided, hey, maybe it's better for you to go this way. So how are things at at Beastlaws, you know, you're training with Jerry at the time, and then maybe walk us through your complete journey and basically in terms of martial arts until you got here. Perfect. So at Sutellas, I actually did have uh, two fights under Sutellas for boxing. And then uh, going to Jerry, I already had a little bit of experience and uh, I naturally always had footwork and Jerry really liked teaching footwork and everything like that. So he really um, liked teaching me all that stuff. And I naturally caught onto it really quick. Mm -hmm. So he, yeah, he was really happy to just get me a few fights. Then he was taking me down to the States right away. My first fight with Jerry was uh, against a bronze medalist at the Nationals from the States. Wow. So, yeah, so he had like 40 fights, and it was my fifth fight. <laughs> so, but when, oh, Sorry to cut you off. When was your first actual fight? How old were you? The actual fight was when I was 11. Okay, so your dad had to sign off on that for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. I was only, I think I was 67 pounds or something like that. Yeah, you're, you're a lighter. Day. Yeah, the kid was 30 pounds heavier than me. That was the only kid they could find for me. Did, did you win that fight the, the against the bronze medalist? Yeah. I, oh, the bronze medalist? Yes, I beat him too. Nice, nice. Yeah, so I was getting, uh, I was happy because usually you open up after 10 fights, but I opened up at like, yeah, like four or five fights. So I was like, yeah, I was excited. And uh, Jerry took me to that path and we'd go to the States a lot. Out of my 60 fights, I only fought in BC, especially maybe four times. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I didn't really fight in BC too much. Most of my fights were either in the States or internationally. So, so what was yeah. the difference between when you, when you went from Sutella's to Jerry's? The biggest difference was just the technical aspect, I'd say. Because Sutella's, they did do work on a lot of fitness and stuff like that. We got to spar, everything like that. But Jerry really broke it down to like the footwork, 
just how every punch is supposed to land, just different stuff like that. There's, those little things make a big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I found that really helped me and just progressed me to the next level. And then from Jerry after that, I luckily got on Team Canada and then I moved out to Montreal for like almost five years. It was like four and a half years and I was traveling the world, fighting everywhere. So, yeah. So so back up a little bit. So how does the process work for you to be a boxer and a representative for Team Canada? So how did you transition from working with Jerry and like what's the border to entry for somebody that like let's say let's say I want to be a heavyweight boxer for for team Canada but like you know like what are the credentials you need and you know how's how is the entry into that world okay so you have to start off and uh first of all you have to be an open fighter you have to have over 10 fights unless you get signed off before that and then uh you need to win the provincials once you won uh one provincials then you get to go to nationals and uh they're from they're on you just have to win nationals and then you're on the team but it's not that easy either once you get on team Canada, you have to keep up a good record otherwise they kick you off the team too so mm. yeah. so so that means you won provincials then nationals then you were then you were able to go on the team so you had to go through yeah. the paces it wasn't just like oh you got this much of a record and now you're on the team no and then after that every year you have to win nationals to stay on the team so yeah okay okay and yeah. were you able to represent Canada and any like major boxing tournaments and things like that? Yeah, I represented them at uh, World Championships, uh, Commonwealth Games. I was supposed to rep them at uh, the Olympic Games, but I ended up tearing my labrum. I actually, uh, I qualify and everything for Team Canada too. So it was kind of unfortunate, but that's when I found out I'm not going to stay and wait for another four years. I'm going to actually just turn pro now. Okay. So that's another thing too. So for you to be a representative, you have to be an amateur boxer. Yes, you have to be Correct. that's like the highest level of amateurs being on like the national the Olympics. Or the Olympics, yeah. Okay, okay. So now you're a professional, you have three fights, three victories. You had some cancellations in between, right? Like some of the fights. Cancellations, yeah. Is is that common in boxing? Like you get that a lot? Because it's it is common in mixed martial arts as well. It's been kind of uh shitty the last few years because uh there's been a lot of COVID stuff and all the regulations and stuff like that. So I can't turn pro at not the best time, but <laughs> yeah. So like, that's a lot of things where like the shows got canceled because of COVID or maybe someone got just a flu or something. So the main event canceled though. So they canceled the whole show, but I was under a promotion where they got me the fights. It wasn't like I had to go look for them. They got me the fights, but unfortunately, yeah, there was a lot of cancellations and it's hard on your body when you're going through those hard uh, training camps and it's right at the end of the training camp, the fight gets canceled. So yeah, it was kind of unfortunate. Yeah, that's that's probably the worst part because if yeah. you don't find a somebody to fill, you just did a full camp, and yeah. now you now you don't even get to like fight. You're basically just kind of like I did a full camp for no reason. It's like almost prepping for like you know, anybody that's prepped for like a physique show. It's horrible to yeah. get super shredded, and then all sure. of a sudden it's like you can't compete. It's yeah. it's the worst feeling, man. Yeah, it's unfortunate, man. Because we'd go and travel too for sparring. Like I went out to California. Sometimes go to Alberta, go just to different places, and like when you find out your fights canceled, like it's not the best feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So we can, we can say that you got started early, but you're definitely, you have skill and talent, you know, you know, maybe more, more one than the other. I'm I'm definitely going to say that you have the hard work because you've been working your ass off since you were a little kid. Yeah. Right. And you know, you got to have, like, I would say you have some degree of talent, but I think it's majority of hard work and time that you put in because you've been doing it at such a young age. But uh, I guess my question is going to kind of be like, you know, what's kind of like coming up next for you in terms of like, what's your projection in terms of your goals? Because now you're three and oh, what's kind of like the end goal that you're trying to achieve um, in, in terms of boxing? End goal is just getting that world championship fight and just getting that title. But until then, there's obviously stepping stones, like getting the continental WBC. There's so many different titles before you get to that world championship. So mm-hmm. I just want to get those uh, major stepping stones and then fight for the world championship as soon as I can, to be honest. Okay, actually, let's take a step back because we want to give a shout out to your team. So who are you working with currently? Um, and, you know, you, you came about them like, is it the same team that you're working with that were helping you with Team Canada or is there a separate team? It's a separate team because my team in, uh, for Team Canada, they're out in Montreal. Okay. So sometimes if we do want to go out there for sparring, I could probably hit, uh, hit up Team Canada. They let me come for sparring or whatever. But uh, here it's Quinnett Boxing down in Vancouver. Yeah, my coach is uh, John Quinnett, and then uh, I got Rebecca as my social media manager. I got uh, Jeff as my strength and conditioning coach. So we have a whole team around us. Okay, so there's Quinnett Boxing. Sorry, go ahead, Tony. 
my t- my guy the one of my guys that did one of my tattoos steve dunford he's there okay steve's there right i think he trains steve. out of there mm. steve maybe if i see him i probably know who it is yeah okay so so uh, yeah that was like another question i had was where are you now because you know sometimes when you think like now you're going to try to make it to that world <laughs> stage yeah. most people think like okay freddie roach mayweather this place yeah. that place you know what i mean so it's cool to see that you're still here but when you're prepping for fights, do you travel to different places to get sparring in, like outside of here in Vancouver or Montreal? Do you go like to the States and get some sparring in? Or how does your prep look like for, because now, you know, you're, you're eventually going to be want to want to become the champion. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, I always wonder because in MMA, you have like uh, the Dagestani guys. I don't know if you're following MMA. No, I do. I do. They're yeah. like, they don't, they don't travel outside of Dagestan that much. Yeah. Like they, they do majority of their camp in Dagestan and then they go to AKA for like a month yeah. and then they fight and they are continually winning. Doing but then great, there's yeah. those other guys that go to these massive camps, you know, with like 10 world champions and then they come that way. So I'm wondering like, how do you prepare in terms of like sparring and, and getting ready for your fights? So if I'm not in camp, usually I'll just stay local and just fight, spar whoever. But if I'm getting ready for a camp, like I said, I did go out to California at the end of the summer when I was supposed to fight. And I went to Freddie Roach's gym. I went to Wild Card and I was sparring a few of his guys. And he nice. seemed impressed. He seemed happy. So, <laughs> you know, like, it's good because John is willing to take me to different places and take me for sparring, get me ready for these things. So I'm just happy and blessed that I have him as a coach. That's probably one of the most important things. And if you look at some of the guys that, that had the talent and the skill to make it, but they never did, it's because maybe they had some people that weren't giving them the best advice in their corner. Sure. So I'm glad, I'm glad, man, you made it to this point. Cause I always wondered, right. And then I started seeing things like, Oh, he won this one. Oh, he's doing really well. Yeah. And, and then uh, I think I messaged you one time to congratulate you. And yeah. then your dad's like, he doesn't run his social media. <laughs> yeah. That's not me. I, I'm, I'm really bad with social media and I know people get mad because sometimes the responses aren't fast, but I do check it when I can, but yeah, mostly it's, uh, I have somebody that runs my social media for me. I think that's better, man. I think your focus, your, your, your main focus should be on your craft. And then, you know, maybe when things slow down and you're hitting that retirement age and you got some of that F you money and you're, (laughs) you're doing okay, then you can get it done. Um, now this is always a question for me because not like when I was competing in jujitsu, I wanted to meet all the world champions, everybody that I watched, like you know, in video to like break down their game. So have you been able to meet like a lot of boxing legends uh, through your travels and stuff like that, or is that still up and coming? Like in Canada, like I got to meet like you know Adonis Stevenson, you see John Pascal, like those kind of guys in Canada. Then in the states, like I haven't really met anybody crazy. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, like the one person that I really want to meet is Roy Jones because that's my favorite fighter of all time. But uh, I haven't met anybody crazy so far. Like I said, I got good sparring with some pretty good pros, and yeah, so hopefully soon I can get to start meeting these pros and stuff like that. In due t- in due time, man. In due time. <laughs> in due time. So I guess uh, at this point, there's something that I I'm like always I always go to the next the next thing in my head, but I wanted to ask you when it comes back to me, I'll. I'll uh, I'll get to it, but like now it, you always hear things about like how somebody should, cause you started at a young age. How did you go from this point to this point? You've kind of explained that. So now let's say you got somebody like a younger cousin or a friend that's like, Hey bro, like I want to, I want to kind of follow in the footsteps. You've yeah. kind of been through it. And obviously you being through it, you know, what's good, you know, what's bad. So somebody that's going through the circuit now, let's say they're up and coming boxer. What are some, some advices you would give in terms of navigating their start point let's say i just started today you know what are, what's a what's a piece of advice you'd give me in terms of like hey bro like if you really want to make it this is probably a good idea i just honestly tell them to first of all go to your local gym and listen to your coach get the technical aspect down first because a lot of people like watching videos of boxing they're like want to start trying the shoulder roll keeping the hands down like me too i keep my hands down when i fight but i've been doing it for years and years and i started with my hands up so I, you have to develop that technical aspect first. So just keep your hands up. Textbook boxing. And I'd say don't stay local. Because when you stay local and just fight local guys, like you're not going to progress your game. You want to go to the States, fight out there, try to go internationally and just get better from that. And just try to go on the national team. Like a lot of people just want to turn pro right away. I'm seeing it a lot lately too. Like guys are turning pro with no amateur accolades. Like you want those amateur accolades because it's going to make your pro experience way easier. Yeah, like, w- w- was it Bernard Hopkins that had a crazy <clears throat> amateur career? 
before he no, turned Bernard pro. Hopkins actually, he I think he boxed in jail or something like that. Yeah, but that that wasn't that wasn't considered professional, right? Yeah, yeah. So he must have had a lot of fights in there. I think it was one of those yeah. unique times where they let them like actually fight in jail, like boxing yeah, matches, crazy. right? Yeah, that's cool. So my my actual question that I wanted to I kind of skipped over was have you still been going to school or did you go all in on boxing and kind of drop out of school or did grade 12 or, you know, what did you do? Cause you got started really young. We're talking like 10 years old. Right. Yes. So, you know, I have a friend of mine in jujitsu. He actually dropped out of school and just went all in. Cause, and he, and he's already, he's already been world champion and stuff like that. So yeah. it kind of paid off for him. So which route did you take in terms of like, did you also do education at the same time or, or what is it? So I finished grade 12 and then, even through high school, like I, I was never the best student. I always tried my hardest, but it was just cause like, you know, I'd go running in the morning f- five to seven, go to school. Then I had gym from like four to like seven or something like that. Like, like it was always crazy timing. So it was just hard to get my homework in and just do all that stuff. Like I was always exhausted, but after grade 12, I actually made the national team I was the youngest guy on the national team. I was 18 at the time. And, uh, they told me I had to centralize. So I did like half a semester at Douglas or something like that. And then I decided to drop out and just, yeah, we, we moved out to Montreal because they told us how to centralize there. Yeah. You know, it's a, myself and Sonny have a different views on school too, though, man. Like, yeah. I mean, some people, they have to do it. That's their thing. They they have a career in mind and stuff like that. But when you're talking about potentially fighting on the stage that most people dream about fighting on, yeah. It kind of depends. Like you really want to spend four years over here. It's going to be subpar because your real focus is on boxing. But I always like to pick people's brains because it a lot of it goes down to like how your parents are. If your parents are like hard nosed, like you have to get an education or that's it. So no, they, they, they do bug me sometimes. Like I should <laughs> be doing it on the side a little bit. And I might take the opportunity because uh Team Canada actually I have like four years in the bank of schooling from Team Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they pay for your education. Like, if you say if you're like on the team for one year, that's one year of schooling they pay for. So wow. yeah, so I might take a couple classes or something just on the side, just keep you active, just so your mind's not always on boxing twenty four seven either. You know, just I would take full advantage of that. They're paying for it, especially. Yeah, for and, sure. and is that permanently? So like, let's say you're like thirty and you want to go to school. Is it? Is I it believe forever, they or? changed the rule now because I think you had five years to use it, but now I think they changed the rule. Oh, so, so you you have like, that unlimited time? I believe so. So what are you doing for downtime then? Downtime. So when you're, you know, like, yeah, it matters. like, yeah, usually my body's like, especially if I'm in training camp, and my body's dead. Usually I just like chilling to be honest. Cause I just feel so exhausted usually. And if I get to see my friends, I get to go see my friends, family, just, I'm very quiet nowadays before I used to like going out sometimes, whatever, but now I just like hanging out, man, at the house and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that, man. That's probably better to be honest. For sure. Cause me, Cause... I don't, I don't drink or smoke. I never have. So I don't really f- find it fun going to clubs and stuff like that anymore. You got you got to stay away from the evil. You know That's what I mean? So like, man. I mean, I mean, uh, if you look at it, bro, like a lot of the guys that become great champions when the money starts coming in, yeah. if they have some things like that, it could it could pull them away from their craft, right? For sure, I've seen so, it. Many times, it so, man. Yeah, if you stay true to that. I mean, that's massive. How many other people can say that that they've never touched that stuff, right? So that's true. that that's huge. Um, I guess like now what's something about boxing that you didn't expect going into it? So like not when you were starting in the beginning, cause obviously you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing, how to stand, yeah. how, how, you know, how to move, how to, how to cut the, how, how to cut off the ring, things like that. But now that you have a lot of time, what's something that you kind of didn't expect? Was it maybe somewhat the politics? Was it something oh, yeah, about was... training? Was it, you know, what, what would you say is like, I totally had no idea. I was like caught blindsided by this. Well, I'd say training was was always like I kind of already knew how training was and stuff like that. And I knew the different trainings they had on Team Canada and all that kind of stuff. But I'd say the politics is a big thing, especially in the amateurs. It's a big, big thing. And just I say like I I never expected I was gonna be traveling the world and fighting. That was like one big thing to me. Like I knew like I'd always go to the States and stuff like that, but going to like Australia, Russia, all these different places I never expected to go. You know, it was, it was cool. It was a cool experience for sure. How how is it when you travel in terms of like you know you're trying different food because you know you don't have it ready the the energy is a little bit different because it's a different country like how did you adapt to those type of things you know like did you ever have times where like oh man I ate this food I got like food poisoning or something like that like you know even things like water right they're they're you know some places can't even touch their water right so like was it a kind of a culture shock for you when you travel to those different places and fought or what you handle it well 
I usually would handle it well, but no, I've I've learned the hard way too with the food poisoning. In, <laughs> in the Dominican, especially, I remember I went there for a tournament and uh, I won my first two fights and I was in the finals. And uh, I ended up getting super, super sick. Like I lost so much weight because I was just like throwing up and everything like that. And uh, they didn't even let me fight. The doctor didn't clear me to fight. So it's kind of crazy. I've that had sucks. it twice where I, the, I made it to the finals and I couldn't fight. It happened in Czech Republic too, but I got yeah. cut up on my eyebrow and like it split open. I had I had two of the hardest fights. I had the I beat the Cuban guy and I beat Brazil. And I was supposed to beat France in the finals, but yeah, I ended up cutting my eye really badly and doctor didn't clear me to fight. Yeah, that's kind of shitty, man. Yeah. But at the same time, you know what I mean? Like if you get permanent damage on that eye, no. you know, I mean at the end of the day, it's like it depends, right? If this is this is this is you winning the the title. You know, yeah. for the bit on the biggest stage, then it's like, let me go. But yeah, for sure. When you're building up your career like this, in hindsight, though, you're probably like, oh, it's the end of the world. But yeah, yeah. Right. So that's crazy, man. That's, that's not so you traveled to Russia, Dominican. You know, what would you say is like, it has been your toughest fight up to, up to date? It's actually a fight that I didn't even lose, but it was a fight that I won. But I'd say it was my toughest fight because they were just so technical. It was when I fought the Cuban guy from, uh, He's from Cuba, everything. He won bronze at the World Championships. He won gold at Pan American Games. Very good boxer. And uh, he was just so technical. So it was kind of like we we're playing cat and mouse kind of game. Like sometimes I'll be chasing him, then he'd be chasing me. And we kind of had similar styles. So it was just hard to get that adjustment. But I ended up making the adjustments and winning the fight. Was this uh, while you were with Team Canada or was this during one of your pro fights? Yeah, while I was with Team Canada. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I've seen some of the highlights from your pro fights. You seem like to handle yourself really well, Yeah. you know, in terms of like, in terms of how you handle the pace, even like your body language in terms of like how you're fighting, there's yeah. no like tentativeness. It seems like you're kind of at home. You got that kind of flow going. Yeah. I'm really, I'm kind of weird. I, I always feel like anxious to get in the ring when I'm warming up in the room and everything like that. Then once I hear my name get announced and I walk into that ring, it just feels like home. I feel so comfortable. So you know, uh, you don't know this about me, but I used to have crazy performance anxiety, oh, okay. right? So like, I used to be like, oh shit. And then I, in the very beginning, when you were young, when I was competing, um, I remember I used to be like, yo man, I got to find a reason to get out of here, right? Like, you know how Mike Tyson used to be in the very beginning? Yeah. How he's, if you've watched uh, Tyson's documentary, he talks about how he's like down there and he sees the subway train. And he's like, I could just get the hell out of here. I remember him saying that, yeah. And I used to be like that. I used to be like, I could just get in my car. Like, what am I doing, right? Yeah. But then I would have everybody there. I'd be like, okay, I got to fight. And then when you go in there and fight, you're it's it's normal. Feels fine, yeah. But that like that that lead up to it used to be pretty bad. And it got better over time, of course, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. But how do you deal with, you know, maybe the stress of a fight coming up? Maybe like, what do you do to deal? Like maybe if you get that bit of anxiety, like what do you do? Like I got a buddy of mine. He, he literally the day before a tournament will just go to the mall with his girlfriend and walk around yeah. just to keep his mind busy. I got another guy. I used to, you know what I used to do, bro? People laugh. I used to watch all the Lord of the Rings movies. Gladiator, oh, Lord of the Rings. Like, I'd watch that stuff. Uh, um, oh, man, Braveheart. I used to watch all the crazy warrior films. And be like, all right, man, like, let's go, right? Yeah, 100%. So what are some things that you do in terms of, like, dealing maybe with anxiety or the stress or, like, you know, that type of stuff? Usually I'm pretty good, like, leading up to the fight. Like I said, usually it just hits me when I'm in the backstage. Like, usually I just get, like, it's not anxiety like I'm scared to fight. It's anxiety like I just want to get in the ring now. You know, like I feel like getting in the ring now. So usually I'll just sit down. Usually my, I'll pray before my fights. That calms me down always. Or maybe I'll like call somebody, maybe my mom guys or dad guys just to tell them, yeah, like keep them updated. Okay, I'm fighting pretty soon. You know, just kind of calm me down a bit. Just just kind of little things like that. But it's just the experience too because I've been doing it for so long now that it's almost second nature now. Like I know that I'm going to have a little bit of anxiety. But it's good because it keeps you on your toes too. Yeah. Keeps you sharp. Yeah. yeah, like like the whole fear is not your enemy type of thing if you know how to use it, right? Sure. Okay, but I what about in the be what about in the beginning? Has it always been like that, or when you were really young, you found that like, oh shit, like I, you, you know, you had to you had that little bit of a hump. Because some people like, especially when I talk to guys at a, the end of their career, they're like, oh man, I I never was nervous. I just you know got so used to it. But I'm like, was it like that in the beginning? Yeah. Right. So like, I'd say I'd say in the beginning I obviously had nerves like when I was 11, 12. But I'd say the big turning point for me where I didn't really get as many nerves was just before I got on Team Canada. When I was about 17, I started going to the States and I was like winning tournaments like when I was fighting grown men when I was like 16, 17. And like from there on, I kind of just 
saw that I had a lot of potential and I, I believed in my skills then. I believed in all the training that I was doing. Because before that, I was always stressing like, okay, I'm working this hard. Maybe my opponent's working harder than me, you know? But then I realized like, and I was talking to people that were like high levels, like on Team Canada and stuff like that. And they were saying like, the amount of your training is kind of crazy. Like, like even when I went on Team Canada, the training was never that hard compared yeah. to like how I was doing it at home. So yeah, it was kind of- But I feel like that's something you're born with. Because I remember when you were a kid, you're like, I can do three classes. Like I could train for four hours if you want me to. Yeah. I know. Right? Like you never had that kind of like, you know, you get crushed by like a kid that's like four times your size, but then you're like, I'm good. Let's go. Yeah, you yeah. do this thing with your shirt where you just do this with your shirt <laughs> and, then, and then you just go right after the guy. Right. So it's 100%. like, I think you, I think that's something that you had from a very young age in terms of like just that energy. It's crazy. Yeah. I've sure. yet to meet somebody that was a young kid like that, that like, you know, when you're like really, really young and you're playing with your buddies all day and you have this energy, let's go ride bikes. Let's go play ball. Like yeah. you had, you had that energy like continuously for like martial arts and training. So yeah. I, I think that's something you had from a, from a young age, man. I want to ask, you now, from, from the outsiders looking into your world. Yeah. What's one thing that people misunderstand about boxing? So like, you know, I like, you know, give me some examples. Cause now you're in it, you're deep in it. Right. And the sometimes when you hear some stuff from the outside, like they're like, oh, Eric, like a guy that doesn't know what he's talking about. Like, oh, Eric, man, if you hit him with the left hook, you probably would have dropped him. It's like, bro, you don't even have any experience. Yeah, yeah. So what are, what are some things that are maybe the one thing that you think that people kind of from the outside looking in misunderstand about the craft? Actually, funniest thing was my last fight. I was fighting a tough, tough, tough Mexican kid. He actually fought a, one of my friends who's a prospect also from Canada. And uh, he gave my boy kind of a hard fight. Like he... He, he put on a pretty hard fight, so I was expecting the same. He was going to put a lot of pressure on me, this, that. But I was I ended up just toying with him. Like, I was playing with him on from the outside, and I was hitting with a couple of shots. I ended up busting my hand in the third round a bit. So <laughs> I wasn't going crazy, crazy after that. But, like, I was still hitting with some hard, hard shots. Like, shots I probably would have dropped other people, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, the guy came up to me after the fight, and he's like, he's like, man, he's like, oh, he's like, you're crazy, good, this, that. He's like, but next time just knock him out. I'm like easier said than done like it doesn't, you don't look i never look for the knockout either i never do like if it comes it comes but like people just think oh you're just gonna land a shot and you're just gonna knock them out that's not how it works though <laughs> yeah i, th I think it definitely is because some of these guys are a lot they're a lot tougher than they may look for sure you know what i mean like if you look at some of the samoan guys they're yeah. pudgy they don't look like they can fight and yeah. I've seen some of these guys take some hits. I would just send people to the hospital yeah. and they're just walking through it. So yeah, it's, it is definitely easier said than done. I totally agree with you. For sure. For sure. So what would you say are some, uh, some resources that you would recommend for people that are, cause, cause we, we do have some people that listen that are into boxing. They yeah. haven't fought yet, but maybe, you know, thinking about getting in their first fight or whatever, what are some resources that you would recommend? Like maybe watching tape or if there's like a specific gym, like let's talk more about our area. Okay. So let's say you were able to, you're restarting your career. You want to get into amateur boxing, you know, where would you train? What would you do? Who would you go see? Like, you know, maybe give us uh, some resources that you would, you know, tap into. Yeah. Like there's a few good local gyms for sure. There's like, like I said, like Bisla's where I started Quinn at boxing where I am right now. There's, there's obviously good gyms, but I'd say wherever is kind of close to, especially if you're starting to like, you don't really want to drive far. Like me, I go to Vancouver six days a week. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't think a lot of people want to do that commute, like just for boxing. So you're still in Surrey, right? I'm still living in Surrey. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm making that commute every, like for six days a week, I'm going out to Vancouver training and everything like that. So uh, yeah, I'd say find a local gym close to you and see how it is. And if you're progressing, getting better then yeah, look into better gyms and different stuff like that. But yeah, just start doing that. Do your wind sprints. Do you keep up with your cardio, watching old tapes on different boxes, not just, not new influ influencer boxes like YouTubers and stuff like that. <laughs> Watch old school boxes like Sugar Ray Leonard, Roy Jones, you know, just different boxes like that and just learn from that. Okay, cool. Um, before Sonny takes over for uh, kind of like the speed round. So what we like to do is we like to do a speed round where people get to know you a little bit more outside of, you know, what we just talked about right now. Yeah. But I'm really interested in knowing like maybe your top two or three influential people in your life, people that have made like a massive impact from your journey from when you were a kid to where you are right now this is kind of just an opportunity for you to give a shout out to maybe people like you know um that you don't often tell them to their face hey bro like you know thank you and stuff like maybe you're like your dad or or maybe some of your quinnet boxing coaches or maybe even like a buddy that you were like training with you yeah. know so you know who are some influential people that helped you till till now 
oh no of course it was my dad because he was with me every day for boxing or like any training in general like anything I needed he'd help, help me cook like he'd make me like nutritious food help me like with my nutrition from when I was a kid I always ate healthy so that was one thing he always helped me with training all that stuff so of course I have to show him out for sure 100 <laughs> percent. and uh honestly like other than that I'd say my whole family because they've always been supportive of me and they've always been pushing me in the right way and my friends my friends have always been a good influence like say if I went out with them like anybody try to like force me to drink some random person they'd be like yo like do you not know who this is like he doesn't drink <laughs> gotta keep on the right path is that so i always shout out my friends too because they're i've been friends with them from day one you know they've been all solid with me and of course like john guys they helped me a lot too because making that transition from amateur to pro and the amount of time they're spending with me they're boosting up my instagram following they're trying to get me big opportunities so yeah i just want to thank them too and thank any coach in the past for sure whether it's Jerry, whether it's my first coach, Brian, any anybody, even you, any coach that was in my life, they've helped me in some sort of way. That's good, man. Yeah. Stay, stay, yeah. that's stay humble. When you make it to the top, stay humble. That's the way to do it, man. 100%. So Sonny, you ready? You want to run? Uh, so basically it's like this. We, you can answer the questions like literally one word answers, okay. or if you want to elaborate <laughs> on it, because some questions are, are doozies. You want to, you might want to elaborate on it. Right. So okay. Sonny will run you through them. Uh, through them now. Go ahead, Tony. All right. First question is uh who wins in a fight? Ali or Tyson? Prime. Prime. Both prime. prime. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say uh, Ali. 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 Ali? Yeah. Ali? yeah. Uh, uh, Tyson who... would agree. Yeah, Tyson would agree. Tyson's, I think he's been asked that question. I think think I've heard Tyson actually say that too. Bro, you know what makes it like even more epic? He gets emotional when he talks about Ali. Oh, for sure. Every time. A lot of people downplay how tough Muhammad Ali was. Like, he was tough, man. So if he could weather that storm and then just outbox him from there. So, but you know what? Like, people sleep on like old school guys. You remember Sugar uh, Robinson? Robinson was a monster. Back in the day, people are like, oh, you know, they're, they're, they think Leonard. They don't think Robinson. Yeah. Well, Leonard was a monster too, but Sugar Robinson, man, that was the original. Yeah, was, <laughs> He's yeah, the OG, monster, man. <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. Next question, uh, blue or red corner? I'd say red because that's usually like the home court kind of. Cool. Yeah. Your favorite day of the week? Monday, that's my day off. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite for everybody else, eh? <laughs> uh, who... Oh, oh he's. He, I think he answered this one. Yeah, you already answered that question. Um, what's the last song you downloaded? I don't even know. Yeah, let me check. <laughs> <laughs> you listen to more rap music or hip hop or a mix? I listen to more. I listen to kind of a mix, but lately I've been going back to my old kind of stuff. I listen to a lot of old school Fifty Cent, but it was feeling good by Ice Wear Bezel. So I don't know if you guys know who that is. Is this movement? Because a, a lot of boxers I've talked to over the years, like I'm. For me, I, I'll listen to anything, but mostly on Punjabi music, right? Yeah. Um, is, is it true that you can't really get into the groove with Punjabi music? It matters or, on the song. It matters on, on everybody has a different vibe. Like me, I get into the mood sometimes. I'll I think the music now with Punjabi is probably different because it's got the more hip hop style. Hip hop, yeah. I think the old school, like traditional music. I think I feel, I feel like you couldn't do it. Like even JT, we'd be working out together and not have drum music on. He's like, bro, your legs moving like you're at a party. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. I know what you mean. Like, legs moving, right? like some, sometimes I'll have some old songs, like, you know, in my rotation. But yeah, yeah mostly yeah. it's more upbeat stuff. Like, you yeah. know, like Siddhu Musa, that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, yeah so Siddhu changed the game though, right? I was yeah. actually supposed to walk out to Levels last fight. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, the DJ ended up messing it up and playing some random song when I was walking in. So <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. J- Jerry had you guys like uh, skip into beats, right? Yeah, skipping and moving her head to beats. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that like something unique or is it like something you notice is common with other coaches? I don't notice. It's not very common with other coaches, but like you see it around the world, like Cubans, like their rhythm so good because they listen to music when they're boxing and moving their head and stuff like that. Mm. And I noticed it helped me a lot with my rhythm because me, I have very good rhythm while I box. And it's because of that. Do, do you still like, use that tactic to date? I would say he he just made us move our head to it. Me and now I just add my shadow boxing to it. Like I'll be listening to music, kind of vibing out and shadow boxing at the same time, working on my rhythm. So yeah, I kind of use it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, at what age do you want to retire? That's hard to say. Probably like mid mid thirties to late thirties, because I'm a lighter weight, so usually don't last as long as other. Like, that's a long older. career too, though. That's that'll be that'll be technically speaking, that's thirty years almost if you go yeah. closer to forty, because yeah, you started yeah. at ten. 
Yeah. Or was it before 10? No, I started around that age, 10, yeah. Yeah, 10, 10, okay. Yeah. You're saying 11 years old was your first fight, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, favorite childhood TV show or movie? Honestly, I'm not going to lie. 50 Cent's uh, Get Rich or Die Try and also one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. <laughs> was Yo, young, bro, yeah. some people, when they when they talk about that movie, they're like, oh, it's garbage. Yeah, a lot of people don't like it, but I love Wait, it. 50 Cent was my favorite. How old are you? Sorry. Pardon me? He's yeah, young. How, when were you born? 24. 24. Oh, oh, yeah. fuck your baby, man. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but you know what? In, in this sport, in this sport, it's 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 yeah. like it's necessary. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, if money wasn't an issue, where would you travel to? Um, in other words, your dream destination. I want to go to Bali. Yeah. Yeah, that's like where I want to go. Like, obviously, I probably I can go there right now, but just with my schedule, it's too busy. I do need a vacation. The last time I had a vacation was when I was like seven. Do they have flights out there? Any, uh, Bali, I, don't, I don't know they might but i haven't seen any I, yet i think when you get to like uh where eric is trying to get to it almost like you have to like pick each fight strategically yeah otherwise it gets to a point where it's like if you fight in a random spot like bali yeah. and maybe yeah. you've been drinking well you're not drinking but yeah. maybe it's like a rough week or whatever and you lose that fight it doesn't look good on top of the record no for sure yeah. um do you read if so what are your top three books that you would recommend Right now, I'm actually reading uh, Sugar Ray Leonard's uh, kind of biography, like about his life and everything. So that's one book I recommend because it's a really good story. Honestly, I like reading about fighters' lives. Like I read one about Oscar De La Hoya. Now I'm trying to find a Mike Tyson book. I've watched documentaries, but I want to read a book about him too. So I recommend whatever you like. Say if you like soccer or something like that, read about them. Read about like, think- Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi maybe, yeah, whatever yeah, you're yeah, yeah. Tyson has that book. It's like I saw just saw it last week at... Uh, uh, who, who has it? Mike Tyson, he has a book, doesn't he? I don't know if he has a book, but we have his like DVD set with all his fights and uh, like has little interviews and things like that. The old one, yeah. But uh, Tyson and his face on it, bro. Right. Even for us, like guys that like bodybuilding, uh, Arnold's uh, autobiography is uh, supposedly freaking phenomenal. Yeah, oh, that'd be crazy. Um, okay, cool. Do you have a major? Did you have a major light bulb moment in boxing where your game changed? It could be a mindset thing, a technique, or even. Um, I'm sure I lost this one. So, uh, like advice from someone. Yeah, I'd say the biggest change for me was when I went out to California and I won my first senior tournament. I was like 17 at the time, and I remember I got in the ring and the guy looked across the ring. I was fighting this uh, Mexican guy, fully tatted, bald head. And he looks out to his corner and he had his kids and wife with him. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I didn't know I was fighting like in the men's division because I was still 17 at the time. Yeah. And I ended up beating him and I ended up being another tough guy right after that. So after I won that tournament, I kind of felt like, okay, I, I got what it takes to fight with these older dudes. You know, like they're like 27, 28 years old and I'm only like 17. Yeah. That, that's usually like a big thing, right? Like when you go from like, can I beat the guys? Or can I beat the men? Yeah. Right. Like I can beat guys my own age. Yeah. But can I beat the guys that are like, you know, ma- you know, the whole man strength thing? Man strength thing, yeah. Right? So, okay. Yeah. Who's the most influential person in your boxing journey? In my boxing journey, like I said, probably my dad, just because he kind of pushed me to be where I'm at. And he always took me like to practices and everything like that. And like, even when I was on Team Canada, like, he's always kind of involved, like, okay, like, what are you doing next? Okay, you got strength conditioning next. Okay, make sure you eat properly. You know, like, he's always there. Yeah, his his dad's name is Robin Bazaron. So like just just for people to know like you know who he is because he, he's he's uh I've known him for years. He's always been uh very candid, very nice individual. Um so I think he deserves like a proper shout out because the parents are like the the quiet ones that not a lot of people hear about till like, you know, Eric becomes a, you know, a champion. Then it's like, okay, cool. Like now you get to see who his dad is, but it's leading up to like those times when you're not really anybody. And they're like taking time out of their day. So they got to work their job to try to pay for stuff and then take, cause I'm learning this too now, man. Like, you know, I'm trying to do my thing. And then I got little kids, Sonny's got little kids. So we realize now like, okay, shit, like this is what it takes. You know, if you want your kids to be something, it's not as easy. So sure, you know, easy. parents are like the, the soldiers that, you know, don't yeah. always get the credit, you know, they get it at the tail end. But I think, I think a shout out for your dad, your mom and all those guys is super important, you know? Sure. hundred percent. Uh, your favorite cheat meal? 
Chicken wings. <laughs> I love chicken wings, man. Chicken wings, eh? I'll have some tonight. Chicken wings are my favorite. This is the, that's like that's like one question we will hundred percent ask every single guest because we're yeah. we're big foodies, man. Oh yeah, chicken wings go, are my favorite, man. Go to place. Honestly, their wings are kind of expensive, but like they're good from SNL. SNL, okay. Yeah. So Sonny's a wing guy. He'll probably go there. Yeah, it's, uh, they're good. Actually, SNL's right by the house, and I've heard so many things about it. I just drive by, and I'm like, oh, I'll see you one day. But just it's a pretty low key kind of like it's a nice spot, but it's pretty yeah, low key. Like yeah, not a lot yeah. of people go there. Um. So, uh, what about your favorite podcast and why? Honestly, I haven't really watched too. I'm not really uh, like I said. Like if I'm watching something, it's usually boxing or something like that. But I guess your guys is now for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. Uh, who's your top five greatest of all time boxers? But do it in order. In, in order? order, okay. Yeah. For number, so number one, one, number one for me is gonna be Roy Jones Jr. Okay, hundred okay. percent. Then it's gonna be Sugar Ray Leonard. Okay. Then it's gonna be Floyd Mayweather. These are just for me. Like, I'm, this is not for everybody. Hey, man, everybody's Mount Rushmore is different, right? Yeah, Floyd Mayweather Jr. And then I'm gonna have uh, Mike Tyson. And then I'm gonna have Muhammad Ali. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, next question. Um, so now it's more of just like a how like I know you you I know you do coaching as well, right? Like yeah. to help people. Do you do that now, or is it kind of based on your schedule, like based on um, based like on I, like you know if a fight's coming up and things like that? I do it, so I have clients and everything, but I just let them know that. Like, I'll, I'll, they all know that I, I'm a pro boxer and stuff like that. And sometimes I have to leave for training camp. So most of my clients, like I tell them in the beginning, and they're all understanding of that. So they're good. Okay, so some somebody that's interested in terms of first, like maybe getting some coaching from you um, in terms of boxing and stuff like that, like how can they reach you? They can reach me on either my, they can reach me on my boxing Instagram. I don't really go on it much, but they can reach me on my other Instagram, just Eric Bazran. That's my private Instagram. You okay. Can hit me up on that, or they can hit up the Art of Movement. That's the company that I'm under. The Art of Movement. Okay, so yeah. I'll make sure that I get um, all that information from you. For sure. And I'll put that in the description as well, and then I'll also put it in the ending captions, just so people can can uh, reach out to you. So, uh, sure. before we wrap things up, uh, when's the next fight? You know, when is it planned for? And like, you know, how can people view in and and show support? For sure. It's probably going to be April 14th, I believe. Okay. Just going to talk about the details and everything. And uh, usually whenever I have fights, it's usually in my uh, bio on my Eric Bowser Unboxing account for Instagram. Okay, solid, solid. So, uh, man, thank you for taking the time. Um, you know, it's been a long time for me and you. Uh, we yeah, haven't seen was... each other in a long time. I've been just kind of pestering your dad. I mean, like, hey, man, how's he doing? Or like, you know, saying some congratulations when I see another victory. So, yeah. um, I, like from me, I hope you make it all the way and um, you're able to become a great champion in the sport because I've seen you since you're a little kid Yeah. and to see somebody like at a young age, putting that much work in um, with a good head on his shoulders to make it all the way. I'm like, you know, that's uh, for me, it would just be one of the greatest feelings just as somebody that was a part of the journey, like a small piece. Um, so yeah. I really hope that you make it all the way in terms of becoming a champion. I know you'll carry the title well for as long as you carry it for. Um, and man, just, basically thank thank you for sitting down with myself and sunny um oh, thank you guys man i appreciate this so much and yeah like like i said like you've been a part of my journey so you know anything i could do to help you guys and the way you guys help me so i appreciate it man thank you all right awesome man well sure. that's a wrap for us guys um and bye everybody